11, page, or letter 11, 1890. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before the doors of probation. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. So, we're going to see something happen before those doors of probation are closed. Which is a blessing. And we're seeing it, but hopefully there's going to be a lot more people that are seeing it. And I'm really prayer concerned about the people who are not going to see it. That's kind of, you know, because, you know, God will send them strong delusions, Second Thessalonians, that they should believe the lie. You know, we've got to be in a position to see, to have that, to see these things happening when they happen. There's going to be a lot of people that are just blinded because they don't know the Bible. They don't understand God. They've never wanted to have any part of him. And so they will fall right into those deceptions. Um, Let's see. Bible Commentary, this is volume 7, page 420. This is the test that the people must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refuse to a spurious Sabbath, fake or illegitimate, will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truce of the heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbaths will receive the mark of the beast. Well, that's the last thing we want, isn't it? And a lot of this I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Um, But what we've got to understand is that there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. And we need to put ourselves in that position and condition. And... uh, Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through the obedience of truth abandon their positions and join the ranks of the opposition. This is where it really gets deep. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up rulers against them. So this is what we don't want to happen, but it's going to happen. And so what we need to do is prepare ourselves and strengthen ourselves so we don't fall into that, you know, because it's going to be a lot of shaking. Now they're talking about a lot of trouble going on. Uh, So how do we strengthen the church? That is the big question. How do we strengthen the church as a core? Now, I'm going to be reading through Revelation, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going through Revelation here a little bit, because I was going through the seven churches in Revelation, and as I was looking at all these seven churches, you know how most pastors always look at the, the downside of all these churches? That's all I've ever heard from pastors is all the downsides of all these churches. And as I'm reading through them, I was like, wait a minute. There's a compliment that God was given to that church. And I'm reading some more. I'm like, there's another compliment and another compliment. And I started putting this whole picture together, and I'm like, wow. God gave us a perfect platform of the characteristics of a godly church in these seven churches. So I wanted to the six characteristics that make a successful, strong church. And this is amazing, because this is one of those things where, how come people don't see this? You know, so instead of focusing on the negative, let's focus on the positive. Now, the first one here, oh, let me share with you the Testimonies to Ministers, page 116. I just got this here. I was just doing some more studying. Testimonies to Ministers, page 116, says, as we near... The close of the world's history, which is today, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. 
The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of the truths that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad for any excuse not to make revelation their study. And I thought, wow, this just went in perfect with what I, you know, what I was discovering here. This is why I tell people, read more, pray more, study more. Okay, the six characteristics of a church uh, that really make a difference. Number one, we have to have a long-standing commitment to Scripture. Now, this is in Revelation 2, 1, and this is the loveless church, Revelation 2, 1, and I'll pick it up in 2, 2 here. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Let me tell you, that is one of the characteristics of the way God wants his churches to be. We need to have that long-standing commitment to Scripture. Which, with, with our church, I think we do a pretty good job of that, don't you? I th- I, and out of all the churches I've been to, over 200 di- different churches all over the you know, denominations and things, I've never found a better Scripture-driven church than the Seventh-day Adventist church. They're, I, they're just not out there. So I think we're doing very, very well on that. Um, and, you know, you look at the things that, you know, Satan does things so slowly, a lot of times nobody ever notices it. And if you look at the things that are acceptable today that would have never been acceptable yesterday, everything from gay marriage to um, uh, the things on television with the violence and the drugs and the... I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on of the things that would have never been tolerated generations ago. And in today, it's just part of everyday life. We see it on TV all the time. It's not that big of a deal, is it? Well, it is a big deal. And here we go with the churches, and you can see the churches slowly fading away all their standards. And the churches are getting weaker and weaker when it comes to their standings on Scripture. They're doing a lot more wiggle room, a lot more compromising. It's like, oh, okay, we don't want to upset anybody. You know, so they don't stand on the solid rock that God gave them. And uh, so that's a big concern. We need to have a long-standing commitment to Scripture. You know, we need to strengthen our theology. We need to strengthen our discernment. You know, and... and when the Bible says in truth and in spirit, that is one of the most important things we can possibly understand. Because if you look at a lot of these churches out there, there's a lot of churches that have a great spirit for the Lord. Especially a lot of the Pentecostal churches. And I mean, you know, there are some great, fabulous people that just have such a spirit for the Lord. But they don't have the truth. And then there's a lot of churches, and I could reference particular people in Adventist churches that, you know, have the truth, but they don't have the spirit. They just don't. They know the Bible. They understand the Bible, but they don't live the Bible by the heart. And the Bible says in truth and in spirit. And when you can get both of those babies running, that's when you can be filled with the Holy Spirit in the most amazing way. And how do you get filled up with the Holy Spirit? If you know the truth, The only way you get filled up with the Holy Spirit is by action, doing something, some little thing. Get involved in something at the church, you know, be a part of a ministry at the church, you know, start communicating your truth with other people. Then God can really work in your heart in an amazing way. In truth and in spirit, it is so important to have both of those. So we need a long-standing commitment to Scripture. Number two... Out of six, we need an unswerving courage through times of suffering. Unswerving courage through times of suffering. And you know we're always going to get suffering, aren't we? Now I'm going to pick this up in Revelation 2.9. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things for which you are about to suffer. 
Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's a great promise, isn't it? He who has an ear, let him hear uh, what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, if you understand what tribulation is, in this particular verse here, tribulation back in those days was what was called crushing pressure. And I don't know if you know what the crushing pressure tribulation was back then, but what they would do to torture people would be to lay you on the ground and take a boulder that weighed thousands of pounds and put it on your hand and start rolling it over your body. And sometimes they would take hours or days to do that. So here's this thousands of pounds on your arm and thousands of pounds and pretty soon it would just go right over your chest and crush you. That was tribulation. That's the actual terminology uh, in this particular verse. Uh, now, how many of us are willing to go through something like that? Personally, I don't think I could, but thank God that he has a Holy Spirit that if it ever did happen to me, I wouldn't have to experience it. Yeah. Um, you know, God can really shield our minds from pain and suffering too, and he promises that he will protect us. Um, so I'm standing on the rock. I'm standing on the foundation that, you know, Lord, you know, because that's something that no human would really be able to, you know, uh, withstand. But, uh, you know, stick to your convictions. And what kind of suffering are we going to get? You know, we don't know, see. And every one of us gets a different type of tribulation, don't we? We do all the time. Look at society. You know, we're criticized. A lot of people think, oh, that's a cult. You know, I've heard that before. Or they're just such legalists or blah, 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 blah. You're calling me something, a legalist, because I love to serve the Lord? You know, I, I don't understand this. You know, so, um, and it could be other things too. I mean, uh, you know, there's so many persecutions that could happen. A lot of people have fear when they don't need to have fear. Doesn't the Bible say fear not, fear not, fear not? We, we should have no fear. Um, it's a natural thing, but that's why God said so many times to fear not. Um, and hesitation. Isn't hesitation a big thing nowadays? How many people hesitate? I think the only time that you should hesitate is when you need to run to the Lord and ask him about it, you know, and instead of jumping into something like, ooh, let's buy that new car, you know? I mean, I think maybe you should need to hesitate there, but, but a lot of people hesitate with their faith um, because they don't have the right type of hope. And uh, we'll talk about the different types of hope tomorrow. Um, so, an unswerving courage through times of suffering. That's number two. Now, number three, we're going to the compromising church. This is the third church. And... Uh, this one is an uncompromising witness that remains on the cutting edge of evil. And I'll pick this up in Revelation 2.13. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. An unswerving witness that remains on the cutting edge of evil. Now, these people were actually in Pergamum. And I don't know if you know what Pergamum is. The town of Pergamum was the, basically Satan's capital. I mean, that is where evil dwelled at that time. It was the worst of any city on the planet. All these evil statues, okay? And these people were in the heart of of the worst possible place they could ever be, and they were still standing strong to their faith. And God complimented them for that. Isn't that amazing? Because everybody looks at the negative stuff of all these churches, and they don't see the positive thing that God was complimenting them on. And what are we going to be? Think about this. If I got the numbers here. 
Seventh-day Adventists, globally, one out of every 200 people is a Seventh-day Adventist. In America, it's one out of 300. Las Vegas is one out of 700. Utah is one out of 1,000. Those are the extremes. But we are in, basically, the worst country on the planet. I hate to say it, because I still think this is the best country on the planet. But if you look at the character of godliness in this country, it has really gone downhill over the last couple generations, hasn't it? And a lot of that, I, I, I'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about family ministries, but we need more family ministries. We need to teach parents how to, you know, raise their children. Uh, you know, we need to learn how to be parents. Most of us did not have parents who taught us how to be parents. And the domino effect has continued ever since the industrial revolution, really. Um, so, uh, but that's, we'll, we'll probably talk about that uh, two o'clock uh, tomorrow. Uh, but we definitely need an uncompromising witness that remains on the cutting edge of evil. And so the whole point here is, what are you doing? Are you one of those churches that's just hiding out in the middle of nowhere saying, hey, we've got our happy little church and we don't witness to the community. We don't get out there and do anything. And let me tell you, I find a lot of those churches and every single one of them is dwindling in population. They're closing down left and right because they are not out there. And God wants us to spend more time outside of the sanctuary than inside the sanctuary. You know, so if you're spending a couple hours a week inside the sanctuary, what are you doing outside the sanctuary? A lot of people, it's just zero. They go to work, they don't witness, they, everywhere they go, they never actually do anything outside the sanctuary. So we got to look at these type of things and find out how active the church is. And 2 o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to talk about some of the activities, some strategies on how you can be successful outside. That's the strategies for community that I'm going to talk about on Tuesday, or um, 2 o'clock uh, tomorrow. So, uh, the next thing I want to share with you is number four, uh, the corrupt church. Number four of what we need to do to have a really powerful church is an increasing zeal for the things of God. This is one of my core beliefs that I have really stuck to for many, many, many years. Uh, and I'll start this out in Revelation 2.19. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now this goes in your personal life, this goes involved in your church, this has to go everywhere with you. You have to have a greater zeal for the things of tomorrow than the things of today. And rather you do it seasonally or annually, next year I want to see this church doing more than it's doing this year. Next season I want to see this church doing more than it's doing this season. You know, we've got to have that particular value. You know, do the pastors have a greater zeal to get more done the next year than this year? We've always got to have that constant greater zeal. Even in your personal lives, are you happy where you are financially? Are, or would you rather have a better income next year? Maybe you need to go to school and learn a little bit more. Maybe that's your greater zeal is you want to go to get a couple years of college so that you can, you know, there's always something that you do for a greater zeal. And, uh, you know, I've done these tours around the country did six years on the road and, and started out in these little trailers and I've always had a passion to do something more, something better every single time I go out doing them. And, uh, and that's when I, you know, I started doing sermons and started doing these little mini core evangelistic series. And a couple of years ago, I just had the passion to build a studio and I said, let's raise the money. So I went out there and really campaigned when I was out there doing events. And the last time I was here, I talked about it. I said, we need to raise money to build a studio. We raised the money. And now we built the studio. I did six years on the road, and on the seventh year, I let the ground rest. I, I did. I, I let the ground rest. I stayed at home, and I just did a few little events, you know, on the weekends around, you know, within a half a day's drive of home and stuff. And, uh, 
we built the studio. And I, I offered 3ABN to build it. I said, 3ABN, I said, I got the money, let's build it. And they said, no, we, we don't want it here. And they said, we'll air everything you have, but you need to build it yourself, that way other networks will pick it up. Amen. So it was wise counsel, because all these, even Hope and 3ABN, they're like competition with each other, and they won't air each other's stuff, and you know, which is silly, but it is what it is. So I took the wise counsel, I built the studio, and I mean, it's pretty good size, we've got three studio sets, we've got four cameras, I'm, I saved up enough to buy a fifth camera, so we're gonna go to five different cameras, all HD, I mean, I've got the commercial lighting, I mean, this thing is gorgeous. And uh, so we started filming and filming and filming. And now we have shows on Loma Linda, uh, 3ABN, they've got all the hard drives now. We have to put things on hard drives because there's so much data. It's like 65 gigabytes for a half hour show. I mean, a DVD only holds four gigabytes or five, right? Yeah. I mean, so we got to do everything on hard drives because I'm just that high tech. And, uh, but, uh, and we've got it on Better Life TV, and we've got two other networks that are coming up this spring. And, and so I, I want to get on about five or ten more networks next year, you know, I, with the health message. And I'm, I'm sprinkling the entire health message with Christ's love. It's kind of like what Dave Ramsey does for finance. That's what we need to do with health. And I'm tired of seeing our church be the tail on this health message. And I want us to be the head. And we've got to get out there and get these messages out in a mighty, mighty way and show what we've been doing all along. You know, and, and, uh, and Food Network came to one of our programs. They loved it so much that uh, we, we got them all the information they needed and some DVDs and our track records, because you've got to have track records, and uh, showed them what we were doing. And I, I, I didn't know this at the time, but we went through 3ABN, that I actually got more viewers, more calls, more book sales, more DVD sales than any other presenter they have. And so they wrote up a nice letter to go along with this for, for um, and so Food Network now put it into an executive producer's uh, hands to do all the logistics. And I don't know anything about it. I have no idea because that's beyond my intelligent level right now. And, uh, but she's got to do all the sponsors and get all these different things taken care of. And it'll probably be a year or two before we actually get programs up there regularly. And I don't know where they're going to put us. It might just be on their new, uh, on their uh, uh, internet food network, which is very successful now. So, but I just leave it in God's hands and keep doing, you know, have that greater zeal. And this all comes down to greater zeal, doesn't it? You just look for things and find things and do things. And when you do things, you're gonna, God's going to give you those ideas for greater zeal. Uh, it, it is one of the most important things we can have, you know, infuse that into your children too. Have them develop greater zeals. I want to get better grades next semester than I got this semester. You know, you get that developed in kids, it will last them their entire life. Always have them on a purpose of having a greater zeal for the things of tomorrow. Um, and it's very tough because nowadays, you know, this millennial generation, the majority of them believe they have no hope to have a better future. You know, they've really been just hammered down. And, and it's not necessary. Um, greater zeal for the things of tomorrow. Um, uh, number five, the church has continuing concerns in congregational lives. And I'll pick this up in Revelation 3, 3. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that they are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. And even in uh, 3, 4, you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And this was one of those churches that really had a tight-knit situation going on. It was a dead church, but it was tight within itself. And, uh, and that's the way we need to be. We need to take care of our congregational brothers and sisters. When they start falling down, let's go grab them and build them up. You know, we went, I had a, a church here a few weeks back. Um, husband died. 
the day before, two days before I was there, uh, the widow lady, she came to church that week. And everybody was like, you know, giving their condolences and everything. And, and it was a very moving time. And the funeral was going to be like the next week. And I thought to myself, what's going to happen to this lady a month from now? Even two, three weeks after the funeral's over and all the dust clears and everybody has said their condolences and they all disappear. And then she's left all alone. And, and so I'm like, we need to think a little bit more here. That's when we need to really go be helping her. And most people just drop the ball. They, they, they don't take that extra step farther. And, and so I really felt this, you know, passion and compassion to say that we really need to get involved in congregational lives. And I'm telling you, iron sharpens iron, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to sharpen ourselves, strengthen ourselves. If you get that tight-knit remnant... Satan cannot pick off those frays. If the remnant is loose because you're not taking care of each other as a family, then Satan can just come over and just pick up every one of those frays and pretty soon there's nothing left. So we need to have a family core that is a tight-knit family. Uh, you know, go over to each other's houses and do Bible studies, have fellowship time, you know, uh, and I'll talk about activities uh, uh, at the 2 o'clock tomorrow too. But when you really fellowship together outside of the church, it really develops that core that you need. And you're going to be in tune with people's, every one of us has problems. And it, it, I would much rather talk to one of my brothers and sisters in the church about my problems than anybody else. I mean, I, I, it's not the kind of thing you're going to go to people at work and talk about. Most people will talk to somebody in the world. They'll talk to the worldly people rather than the godly people. Well, why? Because they don't have a tight-knit core, you know, in their church for them to talk to. You know, it's, it's, okay, let's go to church. We're here for the Sabbath. I'll see you next week. And that's it. That's the way it is. And we need to develop those relationships with the church. Then you've got somebody to turn to in those times of trouble. It is so important. Here, God is showing us the blueprint right in these seven churches of how to have a, a, an amazingly powerful church. And number six, this is the faithful church. Uh, this is um, Revelation 3, 7. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll pick it up in 3, 7. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens the door and no one can shut and shuts the door and no one can open. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. For you have little faith and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Because, this is in 10, 310, you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those that dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. Number six, we have to have a fearless desire to move forward. We've got to move forward in a mighty way. Because God has opened the doors for us. God has opened the doors for us to reach an entire community here. Are we doing it? Look at Paul. Uh, uh, where, I don't have my other book with me. Where was Paul going? Paul went to... Uh, it's in Acts. Do you remember where Paul went in Acts and reached 200,000 people? With the um, Anybody know? Um, Paul went to where? No. Uh, Paul went to a town. <laughs> and one guy goes into town, and it's in Acts, I think, 19 maybe. And he reaches 200,000 people with the gospel in two years. One person, 200,000 people in two years. He never had a cell phone. <laughs> never had a computer. Never even had a car. I don't even know if he had a donkey. He might have. He might have had a donkey. But I'm telling you, you know, he reached 200,000 people in two years. And you look at this community here, I don't think it's much of a problem for us to reach 200,000 people in two years. You know, especially with the technology that we have today. 
a fearless desire to move forward. So there's your six characteristics of what makes a successful, powerful, godly church. A long-standing commitment to Scripture, unswerving courage through times of suffering, uncompromising witness that remains on the cutting edge of evil, uh, an increasing zeal for the things of God, uh, the church has continuing concerns in congregational life, and a fearless desire to move forward. So there's your six. Now where are we? Where are we? I look at the compliments here. Now, God did criticize these churches, too. The only church that did not get a criticism would have been the Philadelphia church, right? And in the corporate world, I always knew that um, when I was going to discipline, uh, counsel a, an employee or any of my managers, I always taught them, you always give them, like, Two compliments and one criticism. So you compliment them, then you tell them what they're not doing right, and then you send them off with another compliment of what they're doing good. And that's the way that you delicately manage people and, and you know, get the point across that they need to do this correction in their life or in their job. And this is kind of what God was doing. He was delicately saying, hey, you need to work on this, but I like what you're doing here, I like what you're doing here. And I never knew I was doing it the way the Bible is basically teaching at the time when I was you know, worldly managing things, casinos and stuff. Uh, but that's basically what I was doing. Now, yeah, the Philadelphia church never got a complaint. So I guess that's the one looking for a raise, or should get one. But let's look at the Philadelphia, or uh, the, the Laodicea church. The Laodicea church did not get a compliment. Now that's not good, is it? And I know all these people that are so proud saying, oh, we're the Laodicea church. They have pride being the Laodicea church. And I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? You know, if, if, if somebody came into my office and I had to discipline them and I could not find a compliment to give them, I better not see him in my office again for quite a while. It's, you know, unless they do finally get a compliment. But, uh, you know, usually the next time you see him is when you fire them and let them go. Uh, because that's just the way it is. If you cannot find a compliment about somebody, and here God is looking at the, the, the Laodicea church. I don't call it the Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, but he's looking at the Laodicea mentality, and pretty soon he's just going to spew vomit right out of his mouth the Laodicea church see I'm not a member of the Laodicea Seventh-day Adventist church I'm a member of the Philadelphia Seventh-day Adventist church okay yeah so there's a big difference there and the only one that's really telling you that this church is a Laodicea church that's Satan that's Satan giving everybody in here an excuse to keep being the way they are that's just what's happening and we need to understand that God has a lot bigger plans for us. And going with Andrews University, here we go. This is the way God opens up doors. I talked to a couple of the uh, theologians up there and uh, Thruster Thorlson, he's one of the best up there. He was actually showing how the Philadelphia church, the sixth church, actually is also the eighth church. And that's the bride of Christ. So the Laodicea church gets spewed out, and the eighth church, which is the Philadelphia church, is the bride of Christ. So we've got to transform our minds away from being Laodicea and become Philadelphia. And even, well, and just to show you, this is part of tomorrow, but, um, you know, Revelation 3.10, because a lot of people think Laodicea is the last church, but it's not the only church. See, that's the point that people don't understand. And it says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those that dwell on it. You know, clearly the Philadelphia church will be here in these end days. It is here. You know, we are the Philadelphia church. And, um, but Satan just wants to, no, no, you're not a Philadelphia. That's the last thing Satan wants, is for us to be transformed into a Philadelphia church, which is the bride of Christ. And uh, so that's what we need to do. Um, but 
this is all about compliments and criticisms because let me tell you, I could criticize the church. <laughs> let me tell you, I could really criticize the church. I mean, some of these churches I go to, it's just like a morgue with a steeple. You know, oh man, no children's ministries, no family ministries, no uh, young adult ministries, no elderly ministries, nothing. No prayer meetings, you know, nothing. In fact, I've had two churches that hated my sermon. Just to let you know, Pastor, I'm just you know, warning you ahead of time. <laughs> I haven't looked at the sermon, though. But it was the only two churches that never had a prayer time with the congregation in their service. Yeah. And I thought, really? I mean, are you that far upside down that you did not have a prayer time with the congregation? Yeah. And so they just didn't want to hear anything except, you know, fluffy bunny sermons, I guess. I don't know. But, um, yeah. So, but... uh, you know, we've got to get this more positive look in our aspect to everything we do. Because if you look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, let me see what I've got here. Uh, well, we talked about the populations a minute ago. Here, here, here. This is what I wanted to share with you. USA Today, um, Seventh-day Adventist growth by 2.5% in 2013 the fastest growing church on the planet. Did you all know that? You didn't know that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the fastest growing church on the planet? Has been for years, percentage-wise, and not in America. Um, Let's see, you know about the Blue Zones, right? The Blue Zones, Seventh-day Adventists are one of five Blue Zones in the world, and they live 10 to 15 years longer than anybody even surrounding them. We're the healthiest church-based religion, people, of anybody on the planet. You know, this is amazing. Uh, 2013, the annual council in Silver Spring, Maryland, on any given day, 3,000 people joined the church. Last year, they had 1.1 million baptisms. That's uh, two baptisms every minute. That's how much this church is growing. It's just amazing. I mean, it's just exploded. And if you look back even like 15 years ago, when they only had, what was it, 6 million? 8 million people. And now they're pushing 19, 20 million. I mean, that is a huge burst of people. That's one reason why I love Jesus, because he knew that the people would use that Laodicea excuse, right? But God's smarter than all of us. And he was able to build the church quietly. You cannot have a loud cry if you've only got 10,000 people in the whole world. You cannot have a loud cry if you have 100,000 people. You know, it's just not going to be a loud cry. And it could get stomped out and crushed extremely fast. You could just take it out. But since it's grown quietly, it's been able to build and build and build up to what we have today, which is literally about 20 million people, and probably double that when you look at all the people who know about the Sabbath truths who are still, you know, you could probably take that times five or times 10 if you wanted to, of the people who are ready to come into the fold. You know, we're right at that edge, I mean, of of huge uh, growth and uh, so, so I just love the way God's like, uh, he's, he's always one step ahead, well, more than one step, probably thousands of steps ahead of everybody. So amen to that. But yeah, you've got to look at the positive side, not the negative side. I, w- I was sharing with Pastor earlier, we had a, um, I, I did a camp meeting with a whole bunch of uh, uh, leaders from the church and, and the conference And I told him, I said, you guys are just doing things so upside down. You keep criticizing the churches. And you're telling the churches, you're not doing this. You're not tithing enough. You're not getting out there witnessing. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. This is what a lot of the conferences do. They just keep, you know, hammering negativity on the people. And if you kick a dog enough times, it's going to bite you. And that's kind of what happened. 
And I think the conferences need to understand that in order to get momentum, you've got to put the positive things out there. Put the things that you're doing that are successful. You know, this is what people want to feed on. And when they see success, it breeds success. You know, and the domino effect continues. You know, and I told them, I said, you know, every single church should have two Bible workers. And the conference should pay for it. You know, and you should never, ever shut down a school. And the conferences should have the responsibility of that. If the school starts dwindling down, the conference should come in with a campaign to get it built back up again. Amen. You know, and if the conferences are in charge of these type of things, they can have more intelligence looking at a school that's successful like yours and use that talent and that knowledge to make another school successful. You know, some of these churches just don't have the brain power to run a school efficiently and professionally. And when the conference is doing it, you know, we can look at things, you know. If people need to be fired, you fire them. You hire somebody else, you know. I mean, that kind of thing happens, you know. But when you have somebody who's trained and knows how to do this, then you can grow. You know, they've got startup teams, right, to, to start up a church. They'll bring in a startup team if they're going to build a new building and everything. And, uh, but they don't have revival teams, you know, a lot of these churches are dwindling down and dwindling down. Get those revival teams in there and get it built back up again. You know, and that to me should be a conference responsibility. I, you know, and so I did this for the conferences. I, I you know, this is the second time I've done a, you know, a, a meetings with the conference leaders. And every one of them is like, yeah, that's exactly what we need to do. So you just rethink things. And, and you know, our world is so far upside down. We're always looking through clouded eyes and, and clouded glasses. And, and uh, you, you know, when you get that discernment, you're going to get that clarity. And then you can really start seeing ways to do things in a godly way rather than what the, the whole rest of the world is doing. So be positive. You know, that's what I do. I, in fact, even when I was a kid, I said, I, I want to smile my entire life. So I forced myself to smile all the time. <laughs> But it, but it works, you know, so now I'm just used to it. <laughs> yeah, got me through some rough times, too. All right, so let's go back to the original quote now. And uh, since I kind of gave you the whole tour of all the things you need to do to be a successful church, the latter rain is given to those who, who have received the seal of God. The seal of God is given to those who pass the Sunday law tests. The latter rain empowers us to give that loud cry, and the loud cry is what calls the other sheep not of this fold out of Babylon. And this all happens after the shaking and separating, which is leading up to and shortly after the National Sunday Laws, which is where we are. And if we can get our character built the way God has blueprinted the character of a church, if we can get our character built as individuals to have that character that God wants us to have, then we're going to get through these times these toughest times. You know, there's people who are going to fall off, and we don't want people falling off. You know, so if you can get your character of a church this way, you're going to be strong, you're going to be solid, and you're going to get through these tough times. And when these people come through these doors, they're going to say, I don't know what it is about that church, but I want some of that. And that's what we need. We need to be that bright, shining light in this community. Because let me tell you, it is a dark, dark world out there, and it is getting worse and worse by the minute. And so we know, you know, exponentially birthing pains are going to be coming extremely fast. And we've got to get in the word. We've got to read more, pray more, study more, get our act together, get your house in order. And not just your house here, but get your homes in order as well. You know, we need men to be men. We need women to be women. We need, we need to, you know, get good training for our children because they're going to have the roughest time. You know, they're the ones that aren't quite prepared as much as we are. And um, so anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow too. But I don't want to keep everybody too late tonight being a Friday night. But uh, amen. amen. Father God, oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you so much. And what a celebration we need to have on this Sabbath day. And I just look at that mirror image of a thousand-year Sabbath in heaven where we're going to be praising and just worshiping and rejoicing, a thousand-year celebration. And it all starts with those first moments coming into heaven. 
Will we be speechless? Will we be in awe? Will we be on our knees? We will be everything. And uh, it's a mystery to us as to what we're going to see in here. But we want to be there, Lord. And Lord, we ask you, we, we come to you, Father, tonight, humbly, Lord, asking you to do something for us. And Father, we pray, Lord, and we give you permission. Something nobody understands, but we know you do. And Lord, we are giving you permission to enter our hearts and enter our minds, transforming us from the inside out. Whatever it takes, Lord, to change us into the people that you need us to be. We plead with you to do that, Lord. And we know time is short, but we know that you can do anything. And so we uh, grant you that authority over us, and then we humble ourselves as your servant to do with us your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that's a unique prayer. When you give God permission, oh, it just opens up the floodgates of amen. amazing things that he'll do in your life. Oh, amen. We want to praise God for giving us the message of God through uh, Mark Anthony. And uh, we want to invite you tomorrow. You know, this is just the beginning. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, he is going to be our main speaker for the church service. And then right after that, we're going to have a special luncheon, a uh, fellowship meal in the gym. Then right after the lunch, we're going to come back here to have another afternoon uh, service, uh, another message from the Lord. And then don't forget on Sunday, Sunday at 3 o'clock, we have a cooking show by... Chef Mark Anthony. And not only that, you are going to be able to taste the food that he's going to cook. And I want to tell you, in the two places that, that he has been there in California where we were pastors, um, it was a wonderful, wonderful meal. And this is a whole new program. It's a whole new program. It's and tomorrow during the service, we have a surprise. You see it up on the stage right now. Okay. So, you don't want to miss tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, we want to thank God for allowing us to come tonight. Uh, we want you to get a good night's rest and then come back tomorrow refreshed to receive further word from the Lord. All right. God bless you. You prayed already. All right. Have a good night.